Um, I mean, I'm just completely overwhelmed by your exceedingly generous, overly generous comments, and actually I don't recognise this person at all, I have to say. It, it, it's <laughs> I know who said that. <laughs> Um, and funnily enough, one of the thoughts came into my head at the beginning of this session um, was um, one of the first a seminar I remember when I early mid 1980s. I think it was Robert Dingwall came to give a seminar at the unit, and for some reason he came into my room to see me. I don't remember why. I think he must have thought I was a very arrogant young woman, which, which I was, I think, at that time. <laughs> and he said to me about a book called Marriages in Trouble, which was the first thing I'd written, the first book, which actually, David, you reviewed with pictures of the, the two um, magpies, you know, because of the um, marriages that were in trouble and only one magpie, so the picture was of one magpie on the, on the front. And Robert Dingwall came in and he said, um, you do make a lot out of rather a little. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I was really pleased about that <laughs> comment. I was, you know, I felt I was vindicated <laughs> because, you know, and in a way that sort of stayed with me that um, whatever material you have, you can make something out of it. And I suppose I learnt as I went along that you had to add the caveats about, you know, what you can say about that data that you've imaginatively, um, um, uh, you know, uh, analysed and created insights from. Anyway, just to go back to my few comments I have to make, and I won't be, I'll be brief. When Roz actually wrote to me from New Zealand, where she was for several months, lucky thing, um, to tell me about the special issue, I have to confess to being absolutely, not only shocked, but actually really horrified. <laughs> um, not only was I not dead, <laughs> I wasn't aware that I'd told anybody that I was about to retire. Um, whatever retirement is, but that's another story. Um, and um, I thought about that later, and I suppose some of it's to do with being a researcher and not being, you know, I'm used to asking the questions of being in control. I don't like much being exposed and being made vulnerable by other people looking at, at my, my work. Well, I don't mind that. I don't mind the work, but it's me. <laughs> um, so, you know, and those of you that have picked up on what Anne said about my biography, she's completely blown the plot because she didn't know this, but I spent the whole of my research quote, academic career, never ever telling anybody how old I was. Not because, <laughs> not because I wanted to be young, but because I knew that because of my generation, the fact that I had 11 years, you know, outside the labour market, that kind of stood against me. And there were all sorts of forms where you were obliged to put your, your age on, and I didn't. And I, I got away with it, apart from one occasion when I was interviewed by the Vice-Chancellor of the University of London, and he, he rather pointedly said, you know, how old are you? And I, I don't remember what I said, but I have a <laughs> feeling I was rather rude. Anyway, I didn't get the job. Um, so, but the other, the other bit was that I've lived under a suspended sentence for the last few years, well beyond the norm of the normal academic male career. And I think the special issue is probably a bit of a salutary reminder of that fact. But of course, this special issue is, means much more to me. And I think one of the things I take from it is that it's a recognition of the invisible work that many of us do in you know, the kind of work we do that's not only unpaid, but actually goes unrecognised by our institutions. And incredibly, it's unrecognised at a time when, you know, journal articles are the, you know, they're the, they're the meat of, you know, how we, we get in our money. 
um, in the institution. But nonetheless, the 17 years of work with Rosalind, so mostly on Sunday mornings, um, I did find very rewarding. And I, I, I still miss it, I have to say, although some of the articles I don't miss at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to, to, on a serious note, I think the study and development of methodology is hugely important. Um, not only does it range right across the social sciences and beyond, it does take us out of our little silos of research and scholarship and it, it embraces and extends our actual practice. And doing research, editing, writing about methods, they're all central to the material and knowledge conditions of academia. And I'm proud to have been part of this. And with Ros, who's been such an effective and reliable and brilliant uh, colleague to work with, and now with Christina and Malcolm's um, help with the editorship, um, this international journal success story lies, I think, in the embrace of its broad range of methods and uh, methodologies right across the social sciences. And I think the journal was very much in advance of its time, and I think it was no coincidence that it was actually contract researchers who instituted it. Um, if I can digress very, very quickly, um, timing, I think, cannot be underestimated. A lot of people have talked about time and timing. Ideas, methods, the moment to strike in the exercise of power. Something, you know, I have fantasies about. <laughs> um, um, and a healthy dose of scepticism is necessary, I think, for not sticking to the standard ways of doing things and challenging static and simplistic assumptions about influence and impact, particularly of academic uh, work. And personally, when I started in this game, as you gather, I hadn't much idea of making an academic or of let alone an organisational career, which I haven't, nor any desire or belief that I could or would do that. Um, and I've forgotten what I was going to say next. <coughs> but, you know, at that time, I think I was always interested in the bigger political canvas and, you know, ideas in the certainly in the, from the 70s and the 80s, we've talked about, you know, how to, to play a part in making society a better place. But I was fortunate in my mentors, um, who not, are not here today, or my academic mentors, and, and they often guided me much against my own instincts, I have to say. But research methodology, I think, found me rather than I it. And I'm glad of that because methodology is, as I've said, the material conditions under which research is carried out. And it brings to the, to the fore how knowledge is constructed. It also keeps you grounded and ensures you stay close to society, which is very important for sociologists. And just a final couple of reflections. Um, I think being a researcher, especially a contract researcher, is a bit like being a writer. You know, those who ply their trade by the pen or the word processor. And um, I was struck by what Alan Bennett said in a recent interview to celebrate his 80th birthday, um, that it's little comfort to a writer to survey what, what one has done in the past. Writing, he said, is not like upholstery. <laughs> it's not something you can set, I can't do it. It's not something you can settle back into. It's not a comfort. It's more like a rebuke. Writing is about now, what you are doing in the present. And indeed, Many writers, I gather, never actually reread their work after it's been published. A researcher's life, I think, is even more in the now than a writer's life, especially contract researchers, who are always looking to the next project while trying to finish off the current one. But in other respects, I think 
research is very unlike what writers do. Research is interactive, it's rarely, well it can be, a solo activity. The social, social research isn't usually um, a solo activity. And knowledge and ideas and ways of doing research are learnt, um, as you've talked about, in the company of other people. They're shared, they're worked out, they're worked on in teams. And while academia itself, I think, remains in many respects the last bastion of individual territorial colonialization, research is different. Uh, Andrew Motion, I heard him talking on Radio 4 not so long ago, and I think he said when he was talking about um, his, um, his opposition to guarding writers' estates after their death, he said, um, we people, writers, researchers, we're all in the swim of life. <coughs> that the air is a common good, I'm not sure he actually said that bit, in which we <laughs> breathe and exhale ideas, knowledge and inspiration. So what he was saying, I think, was knowledge should not be treated as the product and property of individuals. And as Peter Moss and colleagues in their piece in the special issue rightly point out, a nurturing research environment is fundamental to creating communities of practice and to critical research. And, you know, as Peter, you suggested, that's probably why so many of us stayed at Thomas Coram for so long. Certainly, when I came to TCRU in the 1980s, early 1980s, it was a very exciting place to be. Um, and I'd had experience of a couple of other places. But as we all know, environments are precarious. They take time to establish, but they can all too easily be destroyed. And we've become painfully aware of this in an age in which research and education have become industries um, and are chiefly measured by their economic and short-term impact. However, on the good side, despite this rather instrumental context, paradoxically, interest in research methods has become increasingly popular, as we see in the pages of the International Journal of Social Research Methodology and other journals, and I'm really proud to have been part of that development. So all that remains now is to thank the many people who made the special issue and this special day possible. My former co-editor, the speakers, my friends and colleagues at TCRU and in other institutions in Britain and overseas, my colleagues in my second home at the University of Bergen. In short, the huge number of highly talented uh, people with whom I've been privileged to collaborate over very many years. And as I'm beginning to realize um, a long career is sometimes an advantage, even <laughs> if you have to admit to your age occasionally. So thank you, honored guests, and my sons and their families, and my husband, who I promised I would not mention, <laughs> but... <laughs> to whom I owe much for being my most testing critic. <laughs> That's a compliment. Um, and lastly, and particularly, the many people in my life who cannot be here today, those who are no longer with us, those who have written to me uh, instead. Uh, all of these people have played significant roles in my life. And I suppose what I should graciously say now is to... Um, Although I've complained a lot about the world, about institutions, occasionally about people, um, it's really been, I've been really privileged compared with so many people in life to have done the kind of work uh, that I've been able to do. And so it's up to the next generation to take up the baton um, and to move, I'm not going to say the word move forward, uh, to go, <laughs> <laughs> to take research and methods in new directions and different directions. And when the time comes to go, I shall miss it all hugely. Thank you.
I think we can, well, I can see why I wanted to work at TCRU. Um, I've only been here eight months, and um, it's the people here at, at TCRU that are the pull and continue to be the pull. And, and the, the significant intellectual and personal contributions of Julia and her colleagues are just amazing and will continue to influence, I think, well, I know scholarship on family life and children's well being into the future. In one of the contributions for the special issue for Ju Julia, I think it's from Peter and um, et al, can I just use that for, um, for a moment? I, I think there were three um, dimensions about TCRU that were flagged up as being very important in, in creating this nurturing environment, uh, intellectual environment. One was stability, I remember that word, stability, and that's one word that actually does not reflect the state we're in just now in higher education. And I, I want to be positive. Um, I've got my ex-dean at the back of the room here, Richard. Um, but I think what, we're, what I've and, and Julia and others here in the room have been experiencing within TCRU and within higher education in Britain over the last couple of years is great, a great time of instability and a scaling back of public support for research and academic inquiry generally, and it really does worry me. Within that context, we are trying to thrive and move forward and continue with the work that we do so well. I'm noticing we're doing more international work, possibly linked to European international funding rather than UK funding, but also driven by um, questions about globalisation and change in care and gender internationally. Um, we're doing also local work here in Camden, for example. So we'll continue, we hope to continue the really important legacy of Julia, with Julia, alongside Julia, in any way that she wishes and wants. And I know that's a conversation that's ongoing. Uh, I want finally to, um, well, I want before I, I've got to do something important in a moment, Julia, you don't know about. Before I do that, however, I would like to, to, to thank the people who've made today happen, particularly our professional staff, who've really um, been the glue for this, and also my colleagues here at TCRU and at the Institute. Thank you very much, the advisory group who are here in various ways. I see uh, Mavis has just joined us, and we've had an important meeting at the Ministry today. Tell us more about that later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and also the, um, <laughs> don't laugh, Paul. <laughs> Also, our, our very important colleagues who've joined us from other countries. Um, I'd particularly like to thank the publisher of today's special, of the special issue we're celebrating. And they have been very, very kind in creating, this is the, the unscripted un bit for you, Julia. They've actually bound the issue for you. And this is a, a token of the publisher's gratitude as well as ours.